So the way you communicate and the words you choose to use when you communicate are built literally on a foundation and bedrock of oral language from the day you are born. Questions in life, the answers are pretty simple. We just always look for a complex, sophisticated solution. It's our sponges. 80% of development occurs between, between the age of zero and three. I promise you, just give a fifth grader a wordless book and tell him to tell you the story. And they would go, what? There's no words in here. I can't read this book. The Avenue of the Strongest is a podcast dedicated to exploring the lives and experiences of the most inspiring individuals from around the world. Each episode features in-depth interviews with fascinating guests who share their insights and wisdoms on a variety of topics, including education, impact, motivation, health, and learning. Whether you're seeking inspiration, motivation, or simply looking to learn something new, the Avenue of the Strongest has something for everyone. With engaging and thought-provoking discussions, this podcast is the perfect source of entertainment and education. Today, we have a very special guest. For those unfamiliar with the amazing Jen Jones, Jen is an educator with over 28 years of teaching experience. Jen currently specializes in teaching and training teachers on best practices for 21st century instruction, curriculum, assessment, student motivation, and digital literacies. Jen works with schools and districts all over the United States, Canada, and even Australia to train teachers on how to put these best practices into measurable action. Jen, it is such a pleasure to speak with you today. I want to take you back to 1994 when you were an elementary teacher for the San Luis Coastal Unified School District. I would love to hear about the Jen Jones in 1994. What was your experience like just starting out as a teacher? Do you have any fond memories or experience of those earlier years you can share? Absolutely. First of all, thank you so much for having me on your podcast. I really look forward to sharing my message with your audience. Um, So being in education for 28 years, I just want to clarify that I was in the classroom for 16 years teaching kindergarten, first, second, and third grade. And then for the next six years, I was a literacy coach in an elementary school building. And then for the last six years, I've been doing what I do now and traveling around doing professional development and literacy. So with that said, back in 1994, it was also the year that I had gotten married. My husband and I met at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, um, and it was my very first teaching job. And... Just to put that in perspective for you, in 1994, there were um, four teaching positions available in the San Luis Coastal Unified School District, um, and there was 495 applicants. Wow. Okay. (laughs) That's pretty crazy. Not quite the flip that it is now with the, like, North Carolina, or excuse me, North Carolina, I'm in Wake County, Raleigh, North Carolina. And in Wake County alone, which we are the largest school district in the state, teetering back and forth with Charlotte Mecklenburg School District, there are 5,000 current teaching vacancies in Wake County right now. So compare that to where 495 people are vying for four positions and you are basically standing on your head, performing for the school board, doing mock lessons. You know, I had a series of like, eight interviews just to get that position. So I felt, you know, I felt honored to have gotten one of those positions. Um, And my very first year teaching, I don't know why they do this to brand new teachers, but they gave me a three, four combo. And combos really are not a thing anymore. At least they're not out here. But I remember not only learning to be a teacher, juggling third grade curriculum and fourth grade curriculum, learning how to communicate with parents, learning how to communicate with kids, learning how to manage an organization, how to organize a classroom. It was it was just a lot. And it was very overwhelming at times. And if I'm being fully honest with you, there were many, many days and nights that year where I thought, what did I get myself into? Like, is this the career for me? Like, yeah. I don't know how to do this. And that was a time in education where there wasn't kind of the you know, the the political climate and some of the overwhelming ne- negativity that is s- somewhat in education now. And I just feel like what even then it was hard. It was a lot right. that I enjoyed it so much. I had great mentors. I had great master teachers when it was time for me to get my own classroom. And 
I leaned on them a lot. And I, I also developed a lot of really important relationships with the colleagues that were, you know, in the school at the time. I got really close to the third grade teacher and really close to the fourth grade teacher. And they really took me under their wing. And the best advice they gave me was, you don't have to teach them everything this year. <laughs> and that was really important. So focusing on, you know, giving really quality instruction um, over trying to do, you know, quantity and just magnitude. It was just, it was just overwhelming. It wasn't good for me and it wasn't good for the kids, but I enjoyed it so, so much. Um, and just, wow, what a throwback to, have to talk about 1994. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, 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 that's the first thing I wanted to ask you, given that you have so many years of experience under your belt. I really like uh, asking individuals to kind of go all those years back and kind of get those memories, you know, sparkling again and see uh, how that experience was. And wow, that is certainly interesting, right? A 1994 being a teacher, it was hard back then, but today it's such a different climate. So you're the educator behind the brand and website, Hello Literacy. Could you please give us a high level overview of what resources teacher can teachers can find on your website? So through my website um, is really a landing spot in cyberspace for teachers to um, find the resources, the digital and hard copy resources that I have available, including finding professional development opportunities to work with me in your school or district. And also I do sell recordings. So if I've done, a, I did a lot of recordings and um, courses during COVID. And so I've made those available for sale. So they um, can find that there. Um, and just I, I just feel like a, a website is a is a landing spot for people to also read a little bit more about you and judge their judge my credibility and, right. and trust in my field for themselves. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I know. I know you do a lot of PD. I would love to, for, to learn more about that. So when you go to schools and districts, uh, is there like specific type of PD workshops that you do or offer? Yeah, so I was so I would say in general, we talked about earlier in this podcast, we've talked about the educational climate right now. And I feel like post COVID, um, post uh, literacy is in a sort of a, a kind of a rip current right now between balanced literacy and science of reading mm -hmm. in the whole international literacy community. And also just like with job shortages and, you know, political gun control. I just, there's just a lot going on right now in, in education. And I haven't been as busy with, with live face-to-face -face PD um, as I have pre-COVID. And I feel like administration or school boards don't want to overwhelm teachers with like another PD that they're not willing to implement. Because professional development is only as good as what happens the day after the right. PD leaves. You know, you've got to be able to put those things into action in place or else why even bother to do the PD? But um, but I have been um, to California, Wisconsin, Texas, Palm Springs uh, for professional development this year, it, working with schools. A few of them were I worked with before, and they're also on this transition phase sort of with me. They're trusting me to bring them along in the science of reading um, journey and working with them on better practices for early literacy instruction for small group phonics instruction okay and I, I know you mentioned a bunch of states that's a lot of traveling by the way and it is. this in there also as well because when i was looking at your profile you've been to <laughs> many places not just for pd but just also for vacation uh that's that that was that's the first thing i saw i love that you travel a lot i love traveling as well so i do want to ask you and i know it's a very unfair question but what is the top two spots that you you've been to in the last five years that you really have fond memories of um, well, I top two spots. One I'll give you is in the United States and okay. it is my very favorite spot to sort of visit for two or three days at the most. And then you have, you like, you don't need to go back. You don't need to stay any longer and in this place for more than like, three days. Okay. and that's, and that's Key West. Okay. Key West, Florida. Yes. Key okay. West, Florida. Really fun place to visit. So tons of people, great for people watching. The climate, it's it's really tropical there. Um, there's a fun, lots of fun restaurants. Um, Mallory Square has a street fair and craft fair every single night at sunset, um, no, seven days a week. Um, they have some, 
Yeah, it's just a really fun place to go. Like we we do love dub visiting Key West. Um, okay, runner up is Charleston. I love Charleston. Okay. Of course, okay. I love my hometown. I love my hometown. My hometown is Santa Barbara, and I always always love going home. But then, second best place to visit outside the United States is Australia. And I feel really, really fortunate that I've been able to go there three times. Wow. Now, one's on our own as a family. My husband ha- is a professor at NC State and the Agriculture College of Agriculture, and he made a professional relationship with uh, some farmers in Australia. And so we became friends with them and went there first as a family. And then I've been back once with book band tours. It's a group that takes teachers to another country and learn in their school for a week and then the third opportunity to go to australia was to post a hello lit con in um outside brisbane on the gold coast and that was right like a week before covid hit it hadn't hit australia yet but while we were in australia i think it was like march 15th 2020 and so it was literally on the cusp of like we almost didn't get home from australia because of that trip but i feel so fortunate is it, it, it's a really fun country. Australians know how to have fun. Um, they have happy hour every night, seven days a week. <laughs> They're just a fun people. Um, and of course, they speak English. They drive on the other side of the road, but um, it, it's a great. It's a great place. Everybody should try to go to Australia sometime. But even travel, like if you don't travel and you haven't traveled. You have, like, if you don't have a passport, you're less inclined to travel. But once you do get your passport and go somewhere, you kind of catch a travel bug and you realize there's a whole world out there of other people, other cultures, other ways of thinking and doing things that just opens your mind to just see the possibilities of life and the way people live. And I, I love that. A hundred percent. I completely agree with you. And I think everyone should be traveling. I think it's one of the most important things you can do to make yourself a better human uh, because you understand that it's just, you know, we live in New York City and you're, you're right now in North Carolina, but it's just not the U.S. Uh, there's countries uh, in Europe or Asia that's very different, but very respectable, you know, and the culture, the food. It's just different and amazing. And you just become a better person overall. So I I 100% agree with you. I have not been to Australia. Wow, that sounds super awesome. And did I catch that right? You mentioned that you were having a Hello Literacy, like Hello Lit conference uh, that you hosted there. Talk about that. That's that, Yes. How do you, I'm, I'm sorry to cut you off. I only, I, I just want, I want to say something. Um, a couple of years ago, a couple of years ago, we would host science competitions for high school students. We ran the organization. It was a nonprofit. We had maybe 500, 300 to 500 attendees show up. I can tell you it was one of the most stressful things that I've done in my life. And I'll be honest with you, we stopped that. We did that two years in a row. I was so burnt out. It's crazy. I mean, it's crazy to organize anything. So how do you do something internationally? I mean, that's so impressive. I would, I, I think all my hair would already fall out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't know what I was doing at first. Um, prior to the Hello Lit Cons, I would, I was putting on a, a conference with a teacher colleague um, called Happy Go Teach. And I was, uh, and she was still in the classroom. So I was doing a lot of the administrative work and selling the tickets through my website and setting up the, you know, the checking account and the PayPal account and creating the flyers and creating the agendas and getting the tech and securing the venue and getting the liability insurance and doing all of this. And then we did that for probably six or seven conferences. And it was physical conferences around the country. And then the registration went down to that. And after that, I thought to myself, you know what, I could, I could do this. I, I could do this. Like Hello Literacy could do this. Like I could do this. On my own, I have enough content for like, you know, 20 days, let alone figuring out which six hours of content or two days worth of content I'm going to do. So I took all of that institutional knowledge that I learned in the process of putting that on for both of us and started my own, called it Hello LitCon, um, worked with, just spent hours trying to find venues and making deals and trying to get the cheapest rate and... Um, it's really hard working. It was pre COVID. So it was really hard working with some hotels. They wanted you to buy catering and some don't, some want you to do a hotel block and some don't. 
I mean, you, as you know, it is very, very stressful yeah. and it was so worth it. And it's also, it's also just really limiting too. Well, it's, it's great for the, I always capped it at 200 because I wanted to make my conference like a little boutique conference. Like I wanted to be able to talk to every single person and meet with every single person if they wanted to. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want more than 200. So, but it also is only, only 200 can attend. Like I didn't have a live stream. I didn't know how to do that right. at the time. Now COVID, I could do it. And I have right. friends have volunteered to say, oh, I'll, you can sell a virtual seat and I'll stream it for you. Right. But now, now like, you know, I'm like, I don't want to, I don't want to go back to that. It was so stressful. Yeah. I could just sit in my office and sell, you know, my, yeah, so sell, sell double tickets. So it's not the same face-to-face -face experience. It's, it, you know, I hope that my energy and positivity and vibe comes through the screen. I have teachers that say, yeah, you're on the big screen in our living room. The whole family's watching your PD and it feels like you're talking just to me, but it's not the same. You know, you can't, you can't touch me or, you know, but it's, 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 all, it's okay. It, it was a great experience. It was a lot of work on my husband. We mm. purchased a a trailer it's wrapped with the hello literacy logo on it wow. uh, all we sold t-shirts i mean we had lcd projectors both speakers like all the things and it was i mean at the end of that conference day, setting up if it was a one day or two day and then packing up and going to the next city i mean i felt like you know I, I don't know, like Harry Styles or something. I've been like out <laughs> on the road doing all of this work and just day in and day out and night in and night out. And I was just like, we're just really getting really physically tired. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, honestly, <laughs> you have every right to feel like Harry Styles. I mean, that that just sounds incredible. Traveling internationally, 200 guests, that's still a lot. And you throw in the international travel. I mean, that just amplifies it uh, just, just with the challenges. Yeah, so the 200, so the Australia Hell of Lit Con was interesting. That was your original question. And that is because um, the our friends that I was speaking of earlier that we made in Australia, their daughter, who <clears throat> had graduated from uni, what they call a university mm -hmm. over there, she had worked for an educational company. And we were friends with her, um, Dimity. And so she was able to do a lot of the on-the-ground like work over there for contacting venues and things over there and then also australia like I, I i gave out tote bags and like like little merch you know things like pens and stuff and she ordered those all just like straight away from china directly and they were delivered to um to australia since it's just like one continent away like they order from asia all the time and shipping is you know peanuts compared to what yeah. that from here to there so um oh. so it all it all worked and also australia um is when i go to my instagram and social media statistics like my number one city of of my followers is new york new york new york i new york. second okay well we're new york. <laughs> yeah, new york yeah new york and then my number two place is um brisbane sydney and wow. sydney, Bris sydney wow. brisbane and Melbourne are on the east Coast i would not Australia. expect that i would not expect that yeah, I don't, I I mean, it's Australian teaching, teaching in Australia it, it, elementary school is really not that different from teaching in the United States. They have different structures and systems and values. Like they take a snack break every day, a fruit break every day, at like 940, like an hour after school starts. And it has to be fruit, like it has to be orange or apple or um, bananas or something. It can't be junk food. Um, all kids bring their lunch from home. They all have to wear sun hats to recess because the skin cancer is really high in Australia. I mean, so they have different things for their for their continent, but curriculum wise, not that different. Pretty same simple. standard, yeah. Same standards, same outcomes and things. Yeah. Got it. Awesome. Now I do want to share my screen very briefly. I okay. want to show you a very cool picture that I found. Uh, let's see over here. Let me know when you're able to see my screen. I think it's loading now. You probably see it. So do you see ah! that? <laughs> so uh, a shout out to Volvo Cars. Uh, <laughs> but this is amazing. My first question to you over here is, do you still have that license plate or do you still own uh, own that license plate? Yes. Yeah, so in North Carolina, when you um, buy new cars, your plate stays with you. Okay. 
Okay. So you still oh, have, I, like, I still have, it's on my car right now. So I okay. don't have the car anymore because when that car was, and like that, the, even that car is a story. Like I, I just have always wanted a Volvo, like my whole life. I've just wanted a Volvo. And so I bought that one used. It was so 2008. I think I bought it in 2014. But when it was time to, I think it had like 120,000 miles on it. My daughter was going away to college. And I was like, well, I'd rather have her have this. And I'll just, you know, pop, pop into a new one. And right. so the Volvo that I bought after that one was a new um, XC90. And it was the first new car I'd ever ever had and so yeah so it's still on it's hella lit it's still on there xc90 is amazing that's the that's the suv that's the suv correct yeah yeah it makes great great cars okay and it's super super safe no that's awesome that that is awesome okay uh so (laughs) let's go ahead and uh follow up and let's actually get into some education things now uh so because you're a seasoned k-12 literacy expert um, I'd love your advice on what parents with elementary age students should be doing at home to making sure their children are able to effectively read, write, and speak. Are there any <laughs> new tips and strategies or advice you can give to those parents who are just busy? You know, they don't really care much, but you, th- this is something that no matter how busy you are as a parent, you really need to do with your children to set them up for success. Right. So the answers that I'm going to share with you are so super simple. Um, they don't take any money to do. Um, they don't even really take any prep or effort. Um, but the most foundational, the most important, the highest priority thing that parents can do with their kids is just talk to them. And when I say that, I don't just, you know, I don't just mean like, oh, just talk to your kids. But really talking, the educational term for talking is oral language, right? And so you had asked me, or we're going to ask about Common Core Standards, but there's a whole set of Common Core Standards around speaking and listening. And um, what's embedded in oral language is vocabulary. And vocabulary is so key on so many levels um, for success as a reader and as a writer and as just a person, like a literate person. Because honestly, when you grow up and you are um, out of school and people are, you're having a conversation with someone, like when you grow up, nobody cares what your reading level is and nobody cares what grade you got in school. Like people know that you can read and write by the second you open your mouth and say something or right. pick up a right. So the way you communicate and the words you choose to use when you communicate are built literally on a foundation and bedrock of oral language from the day you are born. And oral language is developed by um, reading to kids, speaking to kids, telling stories. And just for, for a lot of parents too, it's, like I always tell, like my daughter is a labor and delivery nurse. And so I'm always telling her, when you send these moms home from the hospital and dads, just tell them literally pick up anything and read to their baby. So like, I don't care if it's a popular mechanics magazine, because if you don't start speaking to your child from the very first day they're born, one, speaking and voices is how parents and babies bond. But mm-hmm. also, like for lack of what to say to a baby, a lot of parents just go, oh, right? Like they, they literally say no words. They just right. go, oh, you're cute, and they change their voice, and there's nothing of substance there. But, you know, a baby doesn't doesn't care, like, what words you say, and they can't cry the words you say anyway. Right. So <clears throat> they literally pick up any book, and you could start reading to them, and you could say, as I have spoken with people around the country, I have discovered a pervasive belief English spelling is inconsistent, illogical, and for some impossible. Like you can literally say anything and you're already developing oral language skills, speaking skills, syntax, semantics, and you just continue that until obviously (laughs) the kids get a little bit older and they're like, what book are you reading? (laughs) And then they have favorites and of course, rereading favorites that kids want you to read. Like parents always say, I've read this book 552 times. I am so sick of it. 
But those types of relationships that kids have with familiar books creates safe of relationships and um, positive relationships around books and reading and home and relationships with people. So it's okay to keep reading a book over and over and over again because kids need that. You know, kids like that repetition. We learn a lot through repetition. And even just verbalizing, like I say, just talk to your students. Even just verbalize your process. Um, Instead of saying, come on, get in the car. We need to go run some errands. Instead of saying just that, say, we need to go in a car today. We need to get in the car. And we need, as soon as we get in the car, we need to buckle up our seatbelt so we're safe. And um, don't forget to bring your water bottle so we can stay hydrated because we're going to be gone out of the house for about three hours. And first we're going to go to, and this is where we're going there. And next we're going to, and just like, almost like talk out loud, like what you're doing and why you're doing it. When you're at the grocery store, instead of just popping your kid in the cart or they're them walking alongside you, you're going to say, tonight we're going to make beef stroganoff. Um, let's see, let's look at the ingredients that we're going to need for that. Um, okay. We're going to go to the poultry, you know, we're going to go to the, the, the meat section and we're going to go to the dairy section. We're going to go to the soups and we're going to look at the ingredients and make sure. And you just like, almost like over talk your day and your process. And a child is like a bonsai tree mm-hmm. and for five years, you water, 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 a bonsai tree. And after five years, it starts to sprout. But but all the while you're saying, I'm not doing anything. This isn't doing any good. But they are literally processing every single thing you say. And they're also processing the way you say it. So when kids mimic you or mimic a singer that they see on TV, it's because kids are sponges. 80% of development occurs between between the age of zero and three. Mm. Wow. So, so important. So, so important. <laughs> wow. I, I love love your answer first of all that's very important advice even for me i'm going to take this advice i don't have a child yet but i I, you know i hopefully will very soon but i i love your answer because it's so simple and in reality most questions in life the answers are pretty simple we just always look for a complex sophisticated solution and in reality humans in general it's 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 a trend we we can't listen to simple advice because it's actually hard to follow simple advice. So I really, I really love that advice. Um, I am going to do exactly what you told me today. And I, you know, for every parent out there watching or future parents, that is such critical and important advice. Thank you so much for sharing that. I mean, I think that's one of the best answers I've heard. And I've done, I, I haven't done a lot of interviews, but just in my life, that is probably one of the best answers I've heard to just a, a question in general. So thank you for that insight. You're welcome. I would like to offer one more simple answer to that question. And that is, um, so background knowledge is a huge um, setback right now for what we're realizing that a lot of students don't have a lot of background knowledge and they're therefore unable to do well on standardized tests and comprehension questions. So they might be, they might read a passage about badminton or the Highland game or a Royal Borealis or Bitcoin or whatever the whiteout or whatever the passage is about. And it's I mean, right now we're starting to realize research is starting to tell us, you know, maybe kids don't have a reading comprehension problem. Maybe they lack the background knowledge to actually answer the questions and understand what those passages teaching us because they have no experience with snowboarding or skiing because they live in QS. Or they don't live in Scotland, so they don't know what the Highland Games are. So <clears throat> even just, again, from zero to five, the simplest things that parents can do is to just include their child on a lot of different experiences. Going to the dentist, going on a bus, making cookies, carving a pumpkin, um, <clears throat> mailing and uh, writing a letter and putting it in the mailbox, um, going to the grocery store. Um, just all every little kind of making fruit salad, making hamburgers, because all of those topics that are just daily schematic background experiences for kids are going to eventually be topics in books or topics right. in they're going to eventually read more about. And the more experiences they have with lots of different things and lots of different people in lots of different places, the more they're going to have more connections and understanding when they're actually reading about it once they start school. 
Wow, that is that is some really great insight, actually. That's really good insight. So since we're talking about parenting advice, I'd love to talk about a very important hot topic that I think needs more awareness. We're kind of talking about it already, so I'll, I'll actually bring it up now. So the increase in the popularity of handheld electronics for young children has had a significant impact on fine motor development in young children. Parents are providing fewer opportunities for children to hone in on their fine motor skills and fewer hand-on tasks. Uh, we own a private preschool right here in Brooklyn. We serve over 100 students in that location. I see this issue firsthand, and it worries me. We're now seven years in for that particular location, and I have seen a decline. I know it's hard, and electronics make it easier, especially when you're a busy student, uh, sorry, busy parent juggling 30 things at once. For all the parents that are watching this video, uh, is there an alternative or something easy parents can do instead of just handing over the iPhone or tablet to their young ones to keep them busy? Something simple. I'm, I, you, I, yeah. you just a simple answer. And I love that because that's what people need, simple. So I'd love your insight on this. Yeah. So super simple answers instead of a tablet are puzzles. There's so many benefits to puzzles, not just like the, the spatial awareness and pattern making, but also just those pro talking out those problem solving skills. Like, are we going to put the edges together first? Are we going to look for all the reds first? Are we going to look for all the same shape puzzle first? Um, and puzzles are a great way to build um, um, the opposite of instant gratification, which video games are instant gratification. And so kids are learning to stretch out their their um their gratification over di a day or two or three until it st until the com puzzle is complete so i didn't encourage parents to like make a puzzle table at your house and just let the puzzle be g g kind of ongoing and let everyone kind of contribute to it and i would start with small puzzles like 50 p pieces work up to 100 and really that really gives kids a sense of accomplishment too like they can be really proud of themselves for completing something that was challenging um, so puzzles are good. Um, alternatives to tablets are like crafts and sticker sheets. And, you know, they make stickers now. They sell packets at Michael's where it's like a sticker puzzle. So you're like looking, it's almost like connect the dots or paint by number. Um, we used to do paint by number a ton when I was a kid. I know Michael's sells really kind of inexpensive crafts um, for kids to do there. Um, parents are reluctant to just let their kids play and use their imagination but that's really good right. um, yeah like make, we used to like make forts in the living room and you know just be creative and learn how to like pick up their you know make messes and pick up their messes um you can do so much math around your house you can go around you can count all the switch plates that have two four and six um light bulbs you can count all the analog versus the you know digital clocks in your house um, read, you know, kids can pick up a book and read parents. Of course, the more can see you reading, the more they're going to realize like, oh, this reading is something I should do. Um, I think that I personally, my own personal children went to Montessori for preschool mm -hmm. for grateful for that experience that they had because it was super hands-on. Um, it was really multi-sensory, lots of block building, lots of STEMI stuff before STEM was a thing. Uh, right. right. And a gross motor running, playing, jumping, lots of coloring. Um, my kids used to do art all the time. And it was like they just would like make designs and then fill in the, fill, you know, how we used to like take our pen, pen and go like this on the paper right. and then all in with colors. So even just like coloring, drawing, right. it's like those, like those creative outlets and parents right. can don't they're sitting with their kids to like do any of those things. Right. Um, I think is important um, for kids. It is, it is, you do, I do feel like parents do feel a pressure right now to like keep their kids entertained. Mm -hmm. And I would say you don't have to, you don't always have to have your kids like in something, doing something, going somewhere. They can just be with like the downtime and appreciate that. And I, and you know, speaking of tablets, I feel like with literacy instruction right now, especially with the science of reading, and I've never, Yes, I do train teachers on digital literacies, but I also feel like you can't do something on paper. You're going to have a really hard time doing it on a device. Like if you can't write or read paper or make your letters, like if you can't do spelling dictation on a piece of paper, you're going to have a hard time doing spelling dictation on a tablet. You can't write an essay. 
Yeah. If you get rid of an essay on paper, you have a really hard time writing an essay on a computer. And writing is actually, there's a research to show that writing and handwriting something out slows your brain down to get it out onto the paper the way it's intended for your brain like to, to get it out. Whereas typing, sometimes we go so fast, at least right. once you're fluent, a fluent typer. But yeah, and there's a lot of research too that links the in the brain, the areas of our brain, the language areas of our brain, like our phonological process area and our meaning center and our phonological phonics processor, our orthographic processor, that the handwriting, the, the actual physical handwriting of like the letter, the sound, the, the, the formation of it, all links back to higher literacy levels mm -hmm. so you know we're i mean like you mentioned in your in your in your pre pre-podcast um that you sent me notes that there are several states that have written handwriting back into right. the standards right. and it, I, in my opinion it should have never been taken out okay. so i don't think i don't i don't know one teenager and i have two children myself that are adults now but neither one of them can write in cursive. Yeah. They write in printing. Mm. Yeah. It's just kind of a lost art. And I feel like hand lettering is a, an art form in and of itself. And I don't mean it like, is. It is. Yes. yeah, like artistic, like the, even the letters behind you, you know, just like artistic. Uh, right. Yeah. Creativity with like fonts and designs and things. Yeah. Right. No, a hundred percent. And I also, I, I want to go back to the early, the early response, which is, I love the fact that you pointed out that about the point of instant gratification and puzzles delay that. And I'm a huge proponent of that. I'm a huge believer in getting, trying to do as many activities for, for students to experience delayed gratification, because that is so important, especially when kids get older and we start talking about real serious important things like finances. You need to have delayed gratification if you even have a chance to become financially independent one day. And it's not just work this nine to five job and you're stuck in this cycle because you take your paycheck and now you're going to instantly gratify yourself by going to the outlet and store and vacation. So I think it's very important. And it, now it's especially scary, right? Because we have social media. Obviously, TikTok is probably one of the top things that are that people are worried about because it's an instant hit of gratification. Instant, instant, constantly. And now, I'm, I'm sure you know, also all studies show that people's attention spans are just going down because even if it's 15 seconds later, it's just, okay, this is boring. Next, what's going to entertain me? It's a, it's a, it's a really interesting and scary situation that's going on right now yeah. but I, I i think de practicing delayed gratification helps uh students adults teenagers in all aspects yeah there's a book that i'm reading right now called the enchanted hour and it's about how to teach and compete with um in a digital age right now how kids are digital living in a digital world or digital natives and that's all they've ever known and how it's just when you remove that device, how you, you just really are trying to compete with holding their attention for longer than, you know, 10 minutes right. and how that is now. So it's called the Enchanted Hour. Awesome. I will definitely check that out. And I will also link it here. Now, sticking to the theme of parents, you have a beautiful family. Loves going through your social media, a loving husband, two daughters. I know that one of your daughters got recently married also, right? Is that correct? Yep. Awesome pictures. Loved it. Uh, so I recently asked the same question to a teacher who had a four-year-old son, uh, but I know both of your uh, uh, daughters are uh, um, adults now, right? But like 21, 21 plus, correct? So I know it's a little unfair to ask you this question uh, since I'm asking you now to again reflect back to the earlier years, but did being a parent change you as a teacher when you were in the classroom? Yeah, absolutely. You know, when I see, when I, when I work with teachers, when I was a teacher, when I was working a teacher in the classroom, working with teachers in the classroom that weren't parents, you could really tell. Um, you just, you just, as a parent, you you realize with kids, you just have to pick your battles. Like not everything is the same priority level as everything as as everything else. Like that some things trump other things, and some things really don't matter. Like it's really unfair to. Um, get down on kids when they don't get to school 
or when they don't make it to school. So attendance and tardiness is 100% a parent problem, not mm. kids. Kids right. should never be penalized for, for rewarded, penalized or rewarded for perfect attendance or you know being late or not being late or whatever because it's 100% not kids' fault. Right. Um, it's hard. And, you know, when it comes to homework, which as a parent, I, when I wasn't a parent, I used to assign a lot of homework because it was the district requirement. Mm-hmm. And as a parent, you just become to resent homework because my ch- children worked really hard from 8 a.m. until 4 p.m. until I picked them up. And now we're home. And now we have this small window of family time. And now you're telling me and my family what to do in this small window of time that I have with them. And it's like, no, I don't think so. Well, like, I feel like, and and the parents that ask or families that ask, what can we do at home or want to do extra, we want homework or so-and-so would like to do an extra project. That's different. But you just blanket homework for everybody. And then grading homework is the worst thing because <laughs> who did it? Who knows uh, who actually completed it? Right. Um, or if the child, you know, like that's especially like during COVID, like you could see kids on COVID and then the parent is over there like mouthing the answers to the child, right? And it's like, yeah. Oh. So, um, so just so you got to pick your battles and teachers that don't have kids, I don't feel like they get the, they don't, yeah, they don't, they don't have that context of the rest of the day outside of school. Right. Um, no, that's that's yeah. that's some that's so that's some really good insight. Now, I want to move on and talk about this image you shared on social media a few years ago. It was uh, of the New York Times article stated, "Your kids aren't too old for picture books, and neither are you." I'll be honest; I have not opened a picture book in forever. Uh, if my child was in fourth grade, I probably would think picture books are just you know not for them because they're already too old. And I quickly Googled a picture book as soon as I as soon as I saw that article you shared. Uh, I googled a picture book. It was a, a hike by Pete Oswald. I was looking at the interior preview pages, and it hit me how true the post you shared was. I mean, I was literally looking at it. I was like, "Wow, this is <laughs> this is crazy." I mean, this is great for even adults. I mean, I think everyone needs to add some picture books to their collection. So, I want you to talk a little bit more, more about visual literacy and why parents should add picture books to their home library collection, regardless of their students age level yeah absolutely that's a great question i'm so glad you asked me about that because i don't feel like parents understand why picture books are important past when their child becomes a reader and beyond when their child becomes a reader but we definitely should there's something called reading comprehension and there's something called listening comprehension and reading comprehension is when i read something myself and i can understand what i read Listening comprehension means you read something to me and I can understand what you read. So it's like you're, you're and listening comprehension should always be two years above the, the, the listening comprehension text should always be two years above their own listening comprehension. And that's why reading aloud to kids is so, so important because un- until they, until, I mean, reading aloud is important until for lots of different reasons and the reasons sort of change as they get older, but until a child learns to decode and learns all the phonics skills and patterns of the English language, um, reading aloud to kids um, works on their listening comprehension until their own decoding catches up. Okay, so just as a, as a, that's, and that's going to happen between the ages of zero and seven or eight. So most kids Mm -hmm. learn all the phonics patterns, all the keys to the code, their vowel teams, their diphthongs, their vowel, their consonant blends and R controlled vowels and those patterns, usually by the end of second grade, usually. Um, but the but past that, once you are reading error free, accurately, fluently, you you're, you're not you're not out of the woods. I mean, you still have to now now that you know what the words say, you still have to think about what the words mean, and that's really where th- third. 12th grade comes in that's where critical analysis comes in that's where well this is what it said but what do I think about that or do I agree or do I disagree and author you know evaluating authors claims and things like that but picture books in general and I know this is counterintuitive to what most people think but picture books are are most of the time a higher lexile level than chapter books 
Excuse me. Because picture books usually are between 38 and 40 pages. That's it. So you have, if you're a picture book author, you have to choose really high utility words to say more with less words. Right. Versus a chapter book author who can kind of has three, 200, 300, 400 pages to just kind of ramble on. And you don't have to really choose your words necessarily carefully because you can talk about one scene, one emotion, one, right. one um, you know, experience over like a whole chapter versus picture book authors really have, have to use a lot of bang for their buck, a lot of punch with every single word they choose. It's really, really important. And, and, and parents and, and librarians understand that. And, but there's even some upper grade teachers who don't understand that because they say to kids, well, you could read now, so you don't get to read picture books anymore. And I always like, no, 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 because um, those those books include so such a higher lexile level, which actually means lexile level is more complex sentence structure, more complex figurative language, more complex vocabulary, and that you're probably not going to find as frequently in a chapter book. Right. So, right. and. Of course, picture books have the the beauty of the picture itself. The illustration lends, you know, it 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 accentuates the words as as well. So you know, if you say, you know, don't you can't read picture books anymore, um, it would be it would be fine if <laughs> if you know there was no if, you know, if the pictures had no value, but you know they right. really had so much to it. And then you're basically like discrediting every illustrator on the planet when you say don't read picture books because you're saying their work doesn't matter. And right. we certainly don't want to send that message. And then standard, common core standard um, number seven is text and visual integration, which means what in the picture is supported by the words and what in the words is supported by the picture. And in lots and lots of stories, as you were saying in that wordless book that you picked up, is that so many so much of the story is told through the pictures and never right. mentioned in the text. So there's lots of opportunities for inferring and visualizing and um, drawing conclusions that you're not going to get from the words. Just pro I promise you, just give a fifth grader a wordless book and tell him to tell you the story. And they would go, what? There's no words in here. I can't read this right. book. And again, they default to lazy or default to I yeah. can't do this. There it's like, Oh, you mean you actually put a little bit have to put a little bit of effort into right. analyze is on every single picture? Yeah. Ooh, <laughs> they don't, they, that's uncomfortable. But I promise you, there's a few whole start a whole storyline. Right. So. No, wow. That that's some really good insight. And yeah, so that is and that is a very good exercise as well. Showing a fifth grader, a fourth grader, a seventh grader a uh, word mm -hmm. picture book and say, Hey, tell me what this story is about. Uh, yeah, that's, that's definitely a great exercise, and I'm going to actually try that. So I I know you mentioned the Common Core standards. Let's touch briefly on the Common Core standards. It's a decade old debate. Some people love it, some people hate it. There's just so much commotion about it. I know some states like New York they moved on to the Next Generation Learning Standards, which is an ad an adoption from Common Core standards. X, Y, and Z. Let's we, we won't go into the fine detail. Uh, and so. Given your deep expertise in reading, spelling, and phonics as a literary specialist, can you let us know your personal thoughts on the current Common Core standards? Do you think that the current standards by grade level do a pretty good job at it, or do you have some any specific issues with it or anything like that? So the Common Core standards were really born out of a <clears throat> era of accountability with, and, and funding. So... If you've been teaching for any length of time, in any century, on any continent, you've been teaching kids how to summarize, how to find main idea, how to supertize, numeracy, you know, geometry, all of the standards are have been taught forever and ever now in every century and in every continent. But by, you know, sort of putting a name to it and a uniform sort of standard to, to it was really an attempt at the government to say, okay, well, these are the set of standards that all kids need to know at a certain grade level. And then <clears throat> that set of standards was probably a, just a tinge higher on the expectation level um, for maybe what they used to expect before. 
And so whenever expectations are higher versus lower, that means more work for teachers and parents. Let's be honest. <laughs> but so, so the Common Core Standards is really a three-part puzzle. And the first part is the standards themselves. And maybe, yes, they're maybe like a little bit higher what, what kids are expected to know. But then the second part of the puzzle is, okay, so now, you, now you've now you taught this set of standards that we say kids should know. Government says, D Department of Education says kids need to know. So then the next part is, so if they know what we think they should know, then we're going to give this assessment to see if they do. And then if they do, then you get the money. Right. And then the part is, oh, and if they do, then you get a bonus and a raise on top of it. Really, it's a really uh, disguised form of, you know, standardization at the back end as well with funding. And so when states say they've pulled out of the Common Core um, standards and renamed them their own um, uh, set of standards, they still have a set of standards. Every state does now, but it's just now it's now it's up to the state because the state basically learned the game after a year or two of playing the game and mm -hmm. said, Bells, whoa, 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 like we don't want to send you all this data at the end of the right. year and we don't need your funding. We're going to do our own thing and we're not going to send you the data and we're going to do our own set of standards and we're going to keep our data in house. And that's demographic data and academic data as well, which academic data standard assess is all really, again, just a, just a, just a minor little dipstick into should we get the money or should we not get the money? It has right. nothing to do with kids. It has nothing really with learning. Um, I get it 100%. No, yeah. I agree. But with all that said, to answer your question about the literacy standards and the, and the phonics standards, you know, um, everything has to every organization and every new thing and every new movement has to sort of rewordify what it is we're trying to to get kids to know and i just feel like you know in 2001 we had the um the national reading panel said okay there's these big five areas of reading that are really important right we have funny awareness, sonic fluency vocabulary and comprehension and then one year later 2001 Paula Scarborough came out with, oh, now we have like these language comprehension strands. We have these decoding and word recognition strands. And then Common Core 2009 came out and said, no, 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 no. We have reading literature, reading nonfiction. So like nobody can get on the same page with like what the, ter the terms are called. Right. But in all of that, um, there's still yet still like reading scores in our country are still pretty much the same as they were in the 90s. Like they haven't gone up significantly. They haven't really gone up at all. Like they're still the same. Right. And I think in in all of that, like even if you look in all three of those documents that I just named, there's not one phonics scope and sequence. And I know that I've, I'm the type of teacher where if you just say you need to teach CVC and short house first, and then you need to teach, you know, digress, and then you need to teach our controlled vowels, and then you need, to, I would be like, great, thank you. Show me the document. Show me the order. But in right. order in documents, was there a phonics scope and sequence? And that's why I wrote those phonics decodables last year, because parents need to know that one of the reasons why their kids aren't reading is because the schools aren't explicitly systematically teaching phonics or WART for the last, I would say, 20, 20 years. And if they did, then that's a pocket of phonics, right. but not it's not everywhere. And now it's starting the science of reading movement is really starting to catch on and right. to know that for their, the, 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 literally the thing that their kids need to be successful at reading and writing and literacy is they need to learn the keys to the code. They need right. to learn letter sound correspondence. They need to be able to auditorily manipulate sounds through phonemic awareness. And that's, I'm sure where your preschool does a lot with rhyming and wordplay and you know just that audible um what i call listening games and um you know uh also but print awareness which again your preschool can really work on print awareness so do kids know the front of the book the back of the book where you know where the print that print carries message that we turn the books from we read from left to right and top to bottom and turn the page from left to right and can they identify an uppercase letter or a lowercase letter and the, can they identify the difference between a letter and a word and the punctuation mark capitals and all of those sort of pre-reading skills all should really set kids up for success to be able to see all the alphabet letters in a word 
and then know, oh my gosh, so I see a CK next to each other. So I say, K, and it's after a short vowel, or I see an open vowel and no consonant blocking it in. So it must be an open syllable. And so like teaching the the, the keys to the code is literally like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory right now. It's like the golden ticket. No. Mm. Wow. 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 That's some really good insight, actually. So I'm going to ask you one last question. Um, so teachers are now, so, I mean, they, they're, they've always been bombarded, but because of, since ever since the pandemic, there's a lot of ed tech startups that are coming out with huge funding and huge marketing budgets. So teachers and schools and admins are just getting pushed with so many different apps and websites and, uh, you know, mobile applications to help teachers teach. Right. Uh, so I think it's fair to say that's overwhelming to teachers to really find the right apps that work for them. Uh, it's a simple question. I'd love to learn some of your favorite apps uh, right now or currently or in the past, whether it's app, whether it's website that you would recommend that, you know, an elementary school teacher to use uh, that, that that you found helpful. <laughs> Actually, I'm not the best person to ask that question to. Only in, in light of some of my previous answers today, I just feel like you know, the apps aren't the answer and also apps and, and, and compute, you know, sticking kids on a computer to like be responsive to their answers and change the questions depending on how they do. There's so much computer testing and, you know, making sure kids log into their iReady account and, right. you know, and, and I, and I'm not a big program person either. Like teachers email me or direct message me a lot and they say, we're getting ready for a reading adoption year. Like what's the best program to adopt? And I'm like, the answer is not in a program. The answer is, is we don't have a one size fits all kid. I right. mean, the again, the gold standard on what it's going to take to, you know, the best this or the best app or the best program is it's like none. Like it's literally teacher knowledge. Like teacher knowledge is the gold standard. Like this book right here, like I have this book that I, that I always recommend to everybody. It's called Uncovering the Logic of English. Okay. And I recommend this book to all teachers and even parents who are curious about English because we have kids, even us, you and I, I don't know how old you are, but I feel like you and I were probably went to school in an era where we would say, oh, why is the, uh, why is the Y in myth, um, is sound or why is the S in island silent or, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. lot, yes. lot some letters do what they do. And our teachers said, it just is, it just does, you just have to learn it. Mm -hmm. And I don't want teachers to say that anymore. And I don't want parents to say that anymore. And kids are very curious about language. But right. when, you know, when you know the rules of, of of the English language and why words do what they do and why letters act the way they act when they're around other certain letters, right? So like C and G are hard and soft. Well, when are they soft? Well, when they're before E, I, or Y. But you might not know that. Right. So book really just and this book tells you like the seven the excuse me the nine jobs of silent e like most people think oh i thought it was just one job like it just jumps back and tells the valve to say its name but there's actually nine jobs of silent e and so this book helps um teachers grow in their own phonics knowledge of the english language because for a language we use every single day to read and to write and communicate with most of us don't understand the background of the language that we're using or the language that we're trying to teach kids how to read and write. Right. So irony is, is, is incredible to me, but, um, I just want kids. I want, I want parents and teachers to say, you know, why is the S in Island silent? That's a really good question. Let's, let's look up the answer. Let's try to find that answer because right. everything that English language is 95% predictable. Right. And, because our language is grounded in the layers of Greek, Latin, French, and Anglo-Saxon, we don't know that. And so we right. need to learn up ourselves about right. the, like to try to teach kids how to be successful in. Well, you know what I am going to do? Uh, my my co-founder, he's having a, his third child, an, an, a, a daughter, it, who's a... Uh, his wife is due in three months. I'm going to gift him that book. I'm going to get, get a copy for myself as well. And I'm going to make sure that she reads that book <laughs> out loud to the child when it's born. <laughs> We're going to go yeah. ahead and practice exactly what you said today. I, again, I think it's very valuable yeah. advice, but I certainly yeah. need to pick up that book as well. I think everyone can benefit from that book. 
So yeah. thank you so much, Jen. It was an absolute pleasure getting to speak with you today. For our audience and teachers and parents who are watching, please do not forget to check out Jen Jones. Her website is helloliteracy.com. Her Instagram following is at hello Jen Jones. Don't forget to check out her amazing resource when it comes to literacy, when it comes to phonics. Jen is the person to go to. Thank you so much, Jen. It was such a pleasure. Awesome. Thank you for having me. Of course.